and my name is Nigel Atamensa. I'm a Relationship Manager at Crown Agents Bank, and this is the Project Inclusion Insights Brief. Um, I'm here today with Josh Pearl. I'll leave it to you, Josh, to introduce yourself. Hi there, Nigel. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Josh Burl. I am the Chair of Project Inclusion, and indeed, I've been doing this for the last three years or so since I joined MasterCard in late 2019. My role is to look after government engagement, financial inclusion, ESG, and fintech um, for MasterCard within the UK and Ireland. Thank you, Josh. Um, and, and it's quite interesting. I feel like our roles are slightly aligned where you cover government relations, public sector relations, and I'm also covering multilateral organizations and governments at Crown Agents Bank. Um, and just a little bit about Crown Agents Bank. Essentially, we focus on moving money where it's needed um, through our various FX and payment services. Um, I'm also part of the project inclusion team within the Payments Association. Um, and today we wanted to really have a debrief in terms of what the year has been like so far, um, looking specifically at financial inclusion and some of the projects that we've worked on in that topic. Um, also thinking about the, the year ahead. So what are we going to look at for 2023? Um, if it's fine with you, Josh, we can kick off with a few questions. Sure. Go ahead, please. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. So I guess the first question, given that we've had such a busy year, and, and hopefully I think we, we've seen that it's been a quite successful year in terms of spreading the message about financial inclusion and making sure that some of the biggest companies at the forefront of financial inclusion um, are doing you know, a lot more beyond serving their own clients, but also sharing knowledge and, and so on and so forth. Why, in your, your opinion, um, do you think it was important for the project team to pursue um, a cross-border payments um, and financial inclusion project? And what do you think, I know the, the outcomes may not have yet become apparent, but what do you think some of these outcomes will be uh, following the implementation of this project? Well, it's, it's a good question. And I think, um, in a way, it's partly because of your membership, if I may say so, Nigel, of Crown Agents, and given the focus of your business on cross-border that we thought it would be well worth looking at that. That's one reason. Another reason is that it hadn't really struck us before you had told us about what Crown Agents does, um, that the extent of globalization and the extent of money crossing borders could have an inclusive element to it. Now, um, you know, within MasterCard, we're obviously very aware of, uh, of that. And indeed, many of the organizations, the fintech startups that we seek to support, have taken um, uh, a look at um, the issue of migration and the extent to which you know people traveling from the developing world to the developed world and then sending money back um, is a viable proposition around which they can launch quasi banking products and card products um, and that sort of thing. Um, and I think as a group, we realized that if that was something that was, well, to an extent it's always happened, but it's increasingly happened indeed the fact that we have you know, in the UK, um, a so-called migration crisis at the moment, um, depending on uh, the way you want to look at it. Um, this is clearly an issue uh, that has a financially inclusive angle to it. You know, the people we're talking about here are probably people l most likely on the margins of society. Migrants, when they arrive in a host country, and if they choose to make their homes there, often have a big interest in benefiting from, you might say, the enhanced wage levels that will be in that country, and then sending them back to family and friends and, uh, and, and whoever else within their personal network um, in their origin uh, territory. That's clearly a, a, an issue of looking at the extent to which, therefore, banking services exist to enable that transfer of cash in a way that ensures those individuals retain as much value as they can. And, you know, we've worked, looked at a, a number of different areas of interest around financial inclusion. This was one that you, as it were, presented to us on a plate and we thought had significant interest and potential to understand, uh, you know, the size of this market, what's going on, what are the latest propositions and et cetera. Um, and uh, we're very happy, therefore, to be um, in the process of releasing some content uh, from various different uh, participants in that market, including Crown, Crown Agents, um, imminently. Thank you, Josh. And I think it's quite interesting because speaking, you know, to some of the things that you said, where certain organizations are used to looking at financial inclusion in a certain way, when you bring several of these organizations together in a forum, I think you realize that different perspectives will then lead you to follow, follow other paths. 
um, which, which you know, we've seen through this project that you can consider maybe the provision of services to local financial institutions, you know, in emerging markets as financial inclusion. Uh, you can consider, you know, providing access to some of the remitt remittance companies, um, you know, in terms of them accessing certain markets, financial inclusion, because ultimately it's the the client on, 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 on the other side that benefits. And the more services that you can provide, the more information that we share, hopefully that the more people that, you know, become included. So I guess speaking to some of these outcomes, what would you say maybe are your, your top one to three um, outcomes that you would expect from this cross-border payments project? So I know we've, we've spoken about information sharing, we've spoken about... Yeah approaching this challenge in a different way, but ideally to you, what would you like to see as outcomes from this project? Well, okay, there are a few things that come to mind. First of all, I love the way in which you, for example, and others that are part of this, talk about the last mile, at the last mile of completing a payment. And, you know, of course that resonates because we're talking about potentially taking money to very, very remote uh, parts of the world where there might not be the level of infrastructure that we enjoy within the, the the developed world, and that particularly appealed to me just because you know my career background was in telecoms, and we often talked about the last mile of telecoms. In other words, you know, getting that call to the person, you know, in the house at the end of the valley, and all the rest of it. And how do you do that? And it can often of, often be seen as very expensive. And therefore, if you if you translate that into the world of payments, you know, the last thing you want is for that person at the end of the valley or, you know, on on some, you know, step somewhere or some dusty plane somewhere um, in the developing world to be the person who is having to cover the costs of that very, you know, that that difficult journey. Um, so in other words, it's a ripe area for innovation, for for, for an investigation into the way in which as much value can be retained for the people who clearly need it uh, need it most. Um, so that's that. That was one thing that particularly resonated to me. Um, <clears throat> another thing that um, I think was was very interesting was the way in which there are so many different parties to this particular area. Yes, there are banks who have a traditional background, like Crown Asians, which of course is you know has quite an august history. Um, but you also have NGOs who are often either issuing money or NGOs in in situ who are receiving that money and distributing it locally. But you also have some really innovative partners like Paycode, who are the, the chief executive of which I interviewed as part of this series, um, who are creating an entirely novel offline infrastructure to enable some of those payments um, into those uh, into those relatively um, remote parts of the world. And indeed, you have the opportunity for other, for other technological partners to join in who can maybe provide some of that online technology as well, whether it be through mesh networks, whether it be through satellite communications or something else. Um, so there's a lot going on, um, you know, in an area that's traditionally been quite narrowly understood and maybe to an extent taken for granted. I guess moving on slightly um, beyond just the cross-border payments initiative, um, what else has been going on in the world of financial inclusion? There are so many topics we've covered this year. What are some of the highlights from those other areas um, in terms of financial inclusion for you? Well, the year isn't over yet, and there's still more that uh, we're in the process of, of, of producing, not least on cross-border, but also on cost of living. But let, let's just sort of turn turn the clock back a little bit, back to the beginning of uh, 2022. Um, well, the, the, the first thing that we did was to produce quite a lot of content on inclusion and crypto. Um, clearly, it's you know a controversial issue, but an area of, of great growth and interest and, and technological prowess, um, a great volatility as well, as we've seen. Um, and um, it was very interesting to speak to a number of different voices, some of them uh, TPA members, about how they see crypto as a tool for the common man or woman or person um, and, you know, the, the role it might actually play for those uh, for those individuals. Ironically, we saw, you know, one big argument around crypto's use being around cross-border as a, as a cheap way of actually transmitting money, which, um, you know, for people who, again, need to retain as much of that value as possible and not have to give it up to pay for the cost of the transaction, and that being one potential very, you know, relevant use case uh, for crypto. Uh, then following on from that, we did a deep dive into sustainability. Again, very, very topical. 
we broadened the borders of what it means to be financially inclusive to talk about the wider issue of values and ethics and lifestyle and that sort of thing and sustainability very much falls into that that was a really interesting study into what are the key pillars that makes a financial services organization uh, sustainable what are the things that they ought to be doing and we looked at a number of different um, partners uh, in the industry to see uh, to see what that told us then of course we moved on to cross border which has been great uh, and we've got content to publish on that um, but then because of course it is perhaps the biggest driver of, of 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 western european politics at the moment we wanted to look at cost of living um driven perhaps by the cost of energy and also by the impact of of of, of the war in in ukraine um and high inflation as a result what is our sector doing? What can it do when it's not just about whether you've got some clever proposition to make access to service easier, but when simply there is an absence of sufficient funds? Um, and so just in the past week or so, uh, we published uh, through TPA a polemic to introduce the topic and to, as it were, act as a sort of curtain raised to the fact that we intend to look at this in a bit more detail and perhaps look at the extent to which we can engage with government, particularly um, given that you know, one of the most important sources of money for so many people out there who are going to be struggling with the cost of living will be the benefit system. I see, I see. And I mean, I think, you know, looking at some of those topics, financial inclusion, cost of living crisis, sustainability, I feel like they're topics that we will probably be discussing for a long time. Um, because they seem to be issues that have reared their heads and, and haven't really gone away um, for a number of years now, especially looking at things on the cost of living crisis side, um, especially as we think about some of the issues that have have, have arisen um, as a result of Ukraine and some other crises um, over the, the past year. Um, so I guess moving on and, and starting to think a bit more about next year, um, what are some of the areas of focus? I know we've probably just touched on them in, in this previous question, but what are some of the areas of focus that maybe particularly interest you? Um, and are there any other areas that we, we may not have touched on that you might like to see? Right. Well, well, first of all, I would say that, you know, if there is something that we haven't touched on yet and, you know, you either as a member of the Payments Association or someone who might be interested in joining the Payments Association feel we should have a look at it, then, you know, our agenda is always open um, for, um, you know, people to ask for resources to be spent on looking at a particular area of interest. You know, we are, you know, the sum of our members, we do what our members want. Um, and so, you, you know, there's nothing closed here. Um, you know, you come along with a proposal if you want. But the specific things that we will probably focus on is to develop a bit more depth on cost of living. Uh, that's certainly something that will extend into Q1 and Q2 of 2023. Um, we have for some time wanted to focus on um, open banking, open finance and open data, the sharing of data and the extent to which that has an inclusive angle. I mean, I'm sure we can all imagine that there has been a lot of benefit to that in terms of the uh, mobilization of new propositions across the fintech sector, which I think has been uh, welcomed. Certainly, we know that the UK government highly values um, uh, the, what has happened with open banking because they are actively looking at ways in which the principle of open data can be extended to other verticals, and they're undertaking research into that. Um, so, so that's something I really would like to uh, to take a, to the opportunity to look at. And last of all, I suppose partly um, because it comes hand in hand with periods of economic hardship is to look at um, ways in which the industry deals with fraud, crime prevention, um, and uh, misbehavior, as it were. Um, and this might be something that we do in collaboration with um, other projects within the Payments Association. Um, so to look at the inclusive angles on tools to address financial crime and fraud. Thank you, Josh. And I think, you know, even speaking to that last point, we saw some of the issues that um, came out of, you know, when several contracts were awarded for COVID procurement, um, and, and that led to a number of fraud incidents as well. Um, and I can imagine, you know, this is probably just on the increase. So I think that kind of information sharing, going to more depth and, and passing on this knowledge to the people who are listening to stuff like this could, could be of massive help. Um, I guess that that rounds up the discussion for today, but I guess I might flip it and say, Josh, do you have any questions for me? Um, I guess, you know, as, as we round up this conversation. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I, you're a relatively new member of the Payments Association. I'd just be interested in your views of, of, of what your engagement with us um, has been like for you. I hope it's added value um, and you feel like it's given you a platform, but I'd like you to sort of describe it in your own words, if you could. 
Okay, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as you as you said, you know, slightly earlier in the conversation, it's definitely been an environment where anyone within the Payments Association is very welcome to come listen, share their opinion, um, and, and see if we can raise an issue to be tackled together. So that's how I came in. I came um, because one of my colleagues was speaking about cross-border payments and what we're also doing on the ESG side, and, and I kind of stuck around. Um, since then, um, I think it's been quite interesting because I think this group has been quite unique where we don't just talk about something, we will then take an action to address that problem as we've had with the opportunity to do the cross-border payments project. I'm sure there'll be many more in the future. So I, I really love the fact that we do, you know, um, address some of the challenges that we, we speak about. Um, and I think the other part of it is the information sharing. Um, I know the, the TPA team um, does an amazing job in terms of sharing the information through the newsletters, through the YouTube, through LinkedIn, and, and probably many other channels that I might not necessarily be aware of yet. Um, and, and I think that the main thing is to expand this reach. Um, so any way that we can support that, um, we'll be doing so. So yeah, overall, the last year, amazing experience. Definitely a highlight to know that I'm part of a community that acts on on some of the issues that we've we've raised. Um, and yeah, looking forward to working with more of the members to address some of these concerns um, in the years to come. Delighted to hear it. Thank you very much indeed. Sounds good. So. Um, I guess that rounds up this discussion and this interview. Thank you very much for joining me, Josh. Um, and thank you to all involved in producing this. Um, and yeah, definitely, if you have any questions, any feedback, if you'd like to be a part of the project inclusion team, um, please do get in touch. Um, and, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you in 2023. Thank you very much. Bye.